This week, Russia attacked Odessa with missiles and drones, seriously damaging the Odessa National Art Museum building, a designated UNESCO monument, which, incidentally, was also 124 years old yesterday. Missiles also hit the city centre, damaging several multi-storey residential blocks. Eight people were injured by shrapnel wounds. Night after night, Russia hits vital infrastructure, residential buildings, transport links and cultural objects. Russia is exacting an ever greater toll on Ukrainian heritage and lives, wealth and industry. When will fascist Russia be stopped and held to account for its crimes? Welcome to Silicon Cut Podcast. Please like and subscribe if you enjoy the fantastic speakers that we feature. Do please also check your subscription as some YouTubers who are covering Ukraine uh, have been complaining that their subscribers have been auto- unsubscribed. Um, and if you want to consider supporting the channel's work, do please become a patron or buy me a coffee. Joe Lindsley is a traveler and writer and American reporting on Chicago's WGN radio from Ukraine each and every weekday of Russia's full-scale war. He was once protege to Fox News founder Roger Ailes, but Lindsley escaped that frenzied world where power mattered more than truth. He came to Lviv for a Catholic uh, Ukrainian Catholic University journalism conference on information overload, AI and responsibility and to an extent has uh, stayed here ever since, and he is trying to build a better vision for the media industry. Joe, welcome onto the channel. Jonathan, thank you for having me. Hello from Kharkiv, uh, 30 miles, this great free city, just 30 miles from Mordor, uh, 30 miles from Russia. And by the way, that when I was invited to give that talk at Ukrainian Catholic University, that was uh, the first day of March, 2020. And I planned to be there in, in Lviv for two weeks. The borders closed. My flight to Germany was canceled. And I stayed. And I said, uh, I think this is going to be one of the freest places in the world. And, and so I stayed in Ukraine throughout the pandemic. I was preparing to leave in January 2022, when it was sort of easy to travel again. And I had this wonderful sojourn in Ukraine for, for, for a couple of years. And that's when we knew Russia was going to invade. And I said, Maybe there's a reason why I, as a journalist, I had not been working as I had sort of taken a break at that point, but there's a reason why I was meant to be here. And so I resolved to stay. Uh, sometimes it sounds crazy to me even, but to stay every single day until victory, uh, because I already knew so much about this country. And here was this chance to sort of redeem my life as a journalist after the time uh, with Fox News. And let's start with this concept of freedom, because I think it's extraordinary that somebody with your network and your experience would essentially decide that the frontier of freedom is here and now. And I assume that you have made the decision that this is the best pace to amplify your skills and knowledge because it's on the front line of a freedom diminishing system versus one that has the potential to expand the horizons and opportunities represented by various freedoms. Well, yeah, well and before that, I want to say, because you opened talking about what just happened in Odessa. And uh, I, here's, I think one of the most important things right now in this moment are the headlines that we do not see, the, the, the negative, the absence of headlines. So the Russians hit an art museum in Odessa, uh, near an art museum, uh, where I was, I was just, I, was, I used to run those blocks uh, just a few weeks ago. Uh, but meanwhile, Ukrainians have been hitting the past several days Russian assets on the occupied Crimean Peninsula. And this is getting missed. And, and, and so Ukrainians, they hit a Russian ship that was almost uh, near completion, the Askold, in the Kerch shipyard. Uh, and a few hours later, what, what does Russia do? They, they can hit an art museum in Odessa. And for, since uh, really for the past couple months, we have seen Ukrainians using precision, precision long range weapons in the West doing extraordinary things totally missed because of Hamas's attack on Israel, which I think is by Russian design as well. But uh, so since September 22nd, you, uh, Russia's Black Sea fleet has been on the run in an extraordinary way. And so I just wanted a caveat that would say Ukraine right now, and this, this can change easily, is winning. Uh, and this is getting totally missed. And, and Russia, because they're weakened uh, militarily, is resorting to propaganda and other tactics. But uh, important as a journalist, you know, I think from my perspective here on the ground to point that out, uh, that, 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 that actually Ukraine is in a position of great strength. Currently here in Kharkiv, uh, just as we began, the air raid alarm sounded. Here, a missile, missiles always hit, almost always hit, 
before the alarm sounds. So it's a strange feeling. When I hear the air raid alarm, I feel calm. <laughs> Probably it's going to be okay. Uh, it's always before the alarm. But lately, the Russians have only been attacking places like this city near the front. And they've not launched, uh, you know, a year ago at this time, we were, every week, there were 80 to 100 missiles fired by Russia. And that's not happening yet. So a little caveat to notice. And as the spirit of freedom, like here in Kharkiv, I spent so much time here during the war. I was here last winter, January, February, March, uh, when, you know, when the sun sets, uh, it gets dark from about 4 p.m., 4.30 p.m. Uh, there was no lights. Uh, you know, some places were still open very sort of secretly. Uh, and, and now there so many shops and restaurants have reopened. I mean, I found myself getting frustrated with the crowds and the sidewalks. And then I remembered this is a good thing. This is a sign of life coming back. But this is this this free spirit uh, of the Ukrainians. And I saw that during my time here in, in the pandemic. And I'm grateful that I had that window into Ukraine. Um, you know, it's sort of a, it's a touchy topic because the pandemic was very controversial around the world. Uh, but Ukrainian society, you know, no one was locked in their houses like they were in France or I think in the UK. There were no you, you, you can't lock Ukrainians up. You can't restrict them. And uh, and I, and this is part of it as the vestures of the Soviet times. They learned how to survive under under tyranny and rules and restrictions. Uh, but I felt like no one stopped visiting their grandparents uh, during the pandemic. That just that was not something that happened here. And so I just saw this the spirit up. But, you know, you, you, you learn how to be prudent in your community on your, you know, with yourselves um, and sort of th this really responsible sense of freedom. And then as I began to talk with people who were in the Maidan revolution, of 2014, I really began to respect that. I mean, when I was at university, uh, University of Notre Dame, uh, I studied political theory. I studied under great political theorists from around the world. And I had never heard anything about, you know, Ukraine had a constitution with separation of powers in 1711, uh, the Kozak, uh, the Kozaks of uh, Pilip Olik. Uh, I'd never heard about that. I, I thought it all came from Montesquieu and, uh, and the Romans. And, uh, and then especially this Maidan revolution where, you know, we think in America, you know, we, we call the media and probably in the UK as well. Journalism is the fourth estate. Uh, and but our, our whole framework of government, you know, we have three branches and then we have the fourth, you know, sort of kind of branch, the media. But that whole framework misses the essence of democracy, which is the people. Uh, and here in Ukraine, I've seen that and, and everything I've studied about. And when I talk with people who are in the Maidan revolution, that was the people coming together and saying, we want to control uh, our country. It's, it's, it's not for the elites to plunder from all around the world. It's for us. It's for we. And, uh, and and they did this in a very orderly way. We look at protests, say, in Paris or other places where they're burning everything down. At the Maidan, you know, near the end of it, the police were disbanded and everything, and there was barely any crime. Uh, and Ukrainians had this extraordinary self-organizing ability, uh, which as I began to learn about it and, and hear the stories of it and see its effect, uh, see how, like, even during the pandemic time, whenever politicians were thinking of making a decision, they had to think about the Maidan because they know, and even here in the wartime, they know at any point you could have a Maidan. And this is like, it's this fifth branch of government. It's just, uh, as a friend described it, it's a ghost check upon power. Uh, and so that's what I've seen here. I see it play out in the war. Uh, we've seen this, for example, when, um, you know, not long ago when President Zelensky dismissed uh, the, uh, the the defense minister and, and regional heads of the defense uh, military uh, recruiting agency, that was a response to the people uh, in the wartime uh, resisting. And and so everything, like you know, th that the Maidan revolution, Jonathan, I think is so powerful. Like that is the only that is the only reason why every week, uh, well, until recently, every week Russia is sending millions of dollars worth of missiles and drones upon this country because of that revolution. They could no longer control this rich and resourceful land. This is a fascinating. I mean, there's a number of areas this could be taken in. And um, of course, people will also remember the images of Maidan with the infamous security forces, the Berkut, um, and their extraordinary violence against the people. Um, there is, of course, a narrative, a weaponized narrative that the whole thing was organized by the CA, blah, blah, blah. And it was just an insurrection. Um, I'm not sure we even need to spend any time on that because it's so patently uh, absurd when you start speaking to Ukrainians. But those instruments of oppression, the Berkut in particular, um, do you think Ukrainians saw that not as a Ukrainian institution, but something, you know, almost like a, a Russified institution 
imposed upon them and perhaps partially controlled from outside the country. Absolutely, Jonathan. And I think, for example, that case for the secret police, they were called the Berkut, which means uh, falcon. And it's a noble title in Ukrainian language, but this was the name of the secret police. And, you know, I, I when I talk to American, because, you know, because I came from the world of Fox News, I started my career at week, the Weekly Standard, uh, the neocons, the people that pushed for the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. But it's important to note, I quit. I fled. Uh, I fled in a car chase from News Corp. Their security guys chased me through the Hudson Valley. I wanted to get I wanted to get away from arguing and politics at all, but I wanted to especially to get away from that world. And along with my friends who served in the military, uh, we began to wake up and say, wait, we don't know, you know, where are we being led? And we need to be we got we, we got to be the authors of our own stories and not just go along with what we're told. And and so I'm I'm sort of a uh, I'm an exile or not exile. I'm an escapee from that world. And, I, you know, when I speak with American American conservatives, uh, my friends uh, who strangely uh, have been either ambivalent about Ukraine or they're hostile to Ukraine. Uh, one of the key points I, I like to raise is before, you know, because especially when I'm speaking with people who praise the protest in Ottawa, the truckers protest uh, and uh, and the, the Danish farmers protest uh, regarding coronavirus. Um, when I speak to them, I say, you know, it, it, before the 2014 revolution of dignity in Ukraine, Ukraine had a secret police force, the Berkut, and they were feared and they were powerful. And when the protests began, they began to shoot people, much more than Justin Trudeau taking people's bank accounts. They actually fired bullets and Ukrainians did not flinch. In fact, more and more Ukrainians came out to the square, the Maidan, as the public square, uh, including the uh, the elderly, like the, the, the grandparents came out to defend the, the, the students. They rang the church bells of the monastery of St. Michael the Archangel when the, the night that the Berkut began to attack the students. And as a result of that revolution, there is no longer a secret police in Ukraine. And I think that's a very powerful point. The people have agency here, and Ukrainians show us that, agent, that we have agency, that it's possible. If we're frustrated, and because I think so much, so many of us in the West, we feel that we're, we're, we're disconnected from politics, disconnected from our destiny. And 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 Ukrainians show us that we, we can be connected in a real way. We can actually take back the society, but we can do it in a way yet. Well, <laughs> there's two sides of this. We can do it in a way that's not violent from us. But as we see the the threat of people in charge, the threat of, of the regular people uh, living, you know, the regular entrepreneurial people living their lives. It is such a threat to those in power. That's the very reason why now Russia is doing everything it can uh, to stop this. To stop this freedom, and this is this is fascinating the way um, you know the conversation is going because Maidan is something that's you know exercised my mind for a long time in my imagination, and having uh, lived worked briefly in Russia, studied Russian and its history, this really is an extraordinary contrast because, as I was discussing with the historian earlier, he said Russia throughout its entire history, almost nobody has elected anything or chosen anything or had any agency in any decision that's been made in almost any class of society and here we have ukrainians taking back a historic agency um that has been suppressed for a couple of hundred years i asked the question of uh, a sort of leading historian Sergei Plachy, extraordinary books extraordinary guy but he's also ukrainian he also has a certain humility and i asked whether maidan will come to be seen as an event on the scale of, uh, you know, 1848, um, 1969, or the great revolutions in history, because I have no doubt in my mind at all that this is a huge pivotal point in history. He said he never thought of that in that way, and that he'll go away and, and think about it. But this exemplifies to me extraordinary humility of Ukrainians who are achieving something seismic and are possibly not even fully aware of the implications of that yet. Well, I think for, they weren't aware. So maybe if they weren't aware of the implications, they are now, ever since February 24th, 2022. And, you know, this is the cost. And uh, as I saw recently, uh, a couple of days ago, in a tribute to one of the many fallen soldiers, uh, you know, this freedom is expensive, uh, but they're willing to, to 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 pay for this. And I think Maidan, I mean, I would put it up there, Jonathan, with uh, 1776, you know, I don't know, as a, you know, I mean, I, as, you know, as an American, of course, and sort of schooled in that tradition, uh, to think so highly of, of that revolution. But Medan, in many ways, is more extraordinary. And and actually, Medan, 
as I look at my own career, work, starting off working with the neocons, and I went in there, I guess, quite naively, uh, you know, the men who started the wars and pushed for the wars and, and purported to control world affairs, uh, a lot of that, you know, they thought they were protecting the nation. There's a lot of psychology and things we can discuss there. But when I look at Maidan I, and, I, when I, and, and when I look at, say, the opposite extreme, I look at, say, Hamas in, in Gaza, we or we look at Russia, we are responsible for our regimes uh, and we're responsible for our, our, our national rhetoric. And 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 Ukraine, the Maidan is, an, in a sense, it's an accusation against the rest of us. And and I think for here, it's sort of for me, it's a redemption thing to see, like, like if Ukrainians had not had Maidan, and uh, a friend of mine who was part of Maidan was telling me this the other day, uh, a Ukrainian, he said, you know, Maidan saved all of Europe, he believes, because if Ukraine had not had a Maidan, Ukraine would be like Belarus, it'd be part of the Russian orbit. And if Russia wanted to, to go into Poland and further into Europe, they would have had the entire Ukrainian army, which back then still was in the Soviet mentality, and had the people not created this rupture and said, no, we're not going to be part of this. Right now, actually, we might be staring, uh, we might be in the face of a much scarier situation because the people said, we're taking responsibility, we choose to be free. And I think for when I look at, uh, in, say, in America and, and our, our rhetoric, you know, and I know this especially from my time at Fox, like, we are so consumed with hate for people that we disagree with. We don't know how to have conversations. That's one thing I love here in Ukraine, even in the wartime, with life and death on the line in extraordinary ways every single day, you can have debates with people. Uh, and, and we can't do that in America. And, you know, when I left Fox, I made, I made a rule that I couldn't have an opinion. I, I could not have an opinion for one year. I couldn't even have a favorite food. I just had to shut up and start listening. Uh, which is something that you know we didn't do at all, and 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 I think if we look at our rhetoric in America and we see the violence within our society in America, we look at the mass shootings, uh, we look at uh, the protests where there was a, the elderly Jewish guy I think is somewhere in California uh, w was killed uh, by a, a pro Hamas protester, but we we see this deep violence, uh, domestic violence uh, also, uh, and you know it's it, it, it concerns me a lot, and I think of you know I before the full-scale Russian invasion. Uh, you know, I used to love a lot of Russian classical music and my favorite writer was Dostoevsky. Uh, and and as I've thought for a while, I just recoiled against that. But now I go back and I think of Dostoevsky's book, uh, Demons um, or The Possessed, where, where he's so well described, like these sort of revolutionary people in the small town city in Russia and and how this this sort of, we, we get possessed with a sense of anger. And, and I see this, in America, and it's concerning. And I think the Maidan is, is, if we can, right now, and with so many Americans, Jonathan, I know who've come here to Ukraine, whether they're uh, veterans who come here to fight, or people who come here as civilians, or a professor from Harvard even, they say Ukrainians could teach Americans so much about how to live, about how to communicate with each other. And I think that's really, that's why I, I, I love to talk about the Maidan, because I think it's something that can help us reawaken our democratic soul uh, in the West. And you know the British, the Europeans can sometimes feel a little bit supercilious and superior when they're discussing Americans. But I will take what you've said there. And we, no less than America, has so much to learn from Ukraine. I mean, this is why I've created this channel um, in the first place, because I felt that Ukrainians under extraordinary pressure on bombardment on every front, electronic, you know, propaganda, weaponization of language, culture, physically attacked. They've had everything thrown at them. And of course, there's the old adage, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Ukrainians are extraordinarily strong. Not only that, they've developed techniques to counter uh, the you know all these attacks. One of those techniques, as you say, is not turning on each other for trivial things. Apart from Aristovich, um, there's almost no one who is willing to throw each other under the bus. Um, well, so not no one. There, there are still plenty of people, but less so than perhaps in our societies, people willing to put their, you know, their, their own self-interest before that of the collective, because that essentially means death for the collective. You know, if you if you if you if you betray your collective here, you're consigning yourself and everybody, you know, to 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 extermination. Um, so that is what's fascinating me. But let's turn that around and the wonder here, and this is going to upset a few people, but never mind. 
if you look at Trump and the kind of imitation dime store Trumpettes and what they are willing to sacrifice in terms of the collective freedom, in terms of collective consensus, in terms of any kind of national values, and they're willing to weaponize so much stuff for their own self-interest. Um, what are your fears for the upcoming sort of uh, election there? And how can we actually tackle the underlying behavior of people acting in 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 self-interest and tribalism, which is which is weakening uh, essentially, you know, the nation state? Well, Jonathan, I think I mean this is a I think maybe it's the essence of the reason why you know it's my mission why I refuse to leave here. I stay here every single day. I get ten minutes on Chicago radio. That's a very loyal audience. Uh, to and w w because it's every day, I get to go deep into Ukrainian culture and history, and uh, and but also to I feel a personal obligation to to reach the Americans uh, who say that they love freedom. Like think about all the Americans who were working in San Francisco and then they fled to Austin, Texas, seeking freedom. Uh, this movement started maybe in 2010, 2011. I know many of those people. And then now you see the biggest fruition of it with Joe Rogan and Elon Musk and others in Austin, Texas. They're looking for freedom, but they don't know what it is because we have this, you know, we've lost our sense of it. And 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 you would think that these people would love Ukraine, even at the level of stories of human excellence, you know, or people defending family and faith. I mean, this is the most religious country in Europe, but it's not in an American religious way. It's natural. It's not polemical. Uh, but uh, all, all this is sort of missed. And so I feel because I came from that world and I know so many of those people, I need to, you know, I have a special obligation to 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 show them this. And the, the first thing, you know, I I mean. I, I because I, I rejected I, and I mean I, I, I recoiled against that world that created the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, I, I, I per, you know I personally I mean I, I was right at the heart of it in 20, 21 years old after Notre Dame and and I, I I ran away from there and I understand the Americans who are or you know on the left and the right who were sick of that and 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 they don't trust the government at all especially when it comes to war uh, and so. I, I understand the, you know, the, the, the sort of the MAGA people who are uh, the regular hardworking Americans who are skeptical of what's happening here. Uh, but then there's we have to this is where we have to look a little bit closer. And, you know, Americans love conspiracy theories, uh, as Richard Hofstetter said, uh, the Harvard historian, uh, you know, the, the, the true style. The, the, he wrote this book called The Paranoid Style in American Politics. That's an enduring thing uh, throughout American history. And I think some of that paranoia is well placed, uh, and and so, but we but we have to make sure that we're not being manipulated as we go into in, into looking at these theories. But if you look at like the, I I saw this in a very personal way. For example, uh, in 2019, you know, all right, President Trump was impeached over a phone call with a foreign leader, not Malawi, not France. The very country that's at the center of everything right now, his phone call with President Zelensky. And there's a lot there that still has to be unpacked. Uh, but my, my personal connection to that story was the, um, I think if you, if you look at it from the outside, at that moment, Trump and President Zelensky were sort of outsiders. I mean, they, they were wealthy and privileged, but they were political outsiders. And they were poised to work together. Uh, in fact, uh, President, uh, President Zelensky had just hired as his speechwriter, uh, Yulia Mendel. Uh, and one month or like two months before May 2019, she broke the story in the New York Times about uh, Joe Biden's son working, uh, uh, Hunter Biden, working with Burisma, which was not a Ukrainian company. It was it was part of the Yanukovych regime that the Ukrainians kicked out of the country. And, and in fact, Burisma, uh, the, the officials were in Moscow the day that uh, Putin took Crimea. So Zelensky hired as his press secretary. The girl, the reporter, the woman who who was breaking, investigating Joe Biden's son, not Biden, but his son's connections uh, to Russian uh, anti-Ukrainian oligarchs. And so Zelensky probably knew more than Trump at that moment about what was going on. Uh, and they were poised to work together, but someone did not want them to work together. And and it was over this that for the Trump's first impeachment. The other impeachments are totally different. But this first impeachment it, it, it's a mystery to me. I mean, it, it was because the Trump and Zelensky were trying to work together. I believe someone wanted to stop that. And I saw the actual effects of it because uh, two months later, I was traveling around um, around this region of the world. Uh, Showtime made a TV show about 
my old boss, Roger Ailes, and some actor was playing me. It was called The Loudest Voice. Russell Crowe played my boss, and some guy played me, and that was too much. Jonathan, it was too crazy and too much to, uh, to handle, so I went to hide out in the Caucasus Mountains of Georgia. Uh, and then I had friends that were uh, going to look for their roots in Ukraine, so I ended up in Lviv, uh, and I met great journalists. That's where I first began to hear the stories of the Maidan Revolution. I stuck around for a month and a half, and then I had to fly to Washington for a conference, October 2019. Uh, and this is right when the impeachment was beginning over that phone call with President Zelensky. And I, I get to Washington and I check into my hotel and uh, the, the staff's like, oh, where are you coming from? I said, Ukraine. And they all jump away from me. They're like, it's a dirty ward right now, Washington. And two days later, I go to the White House to have a coffee uh, with a friend who worked on the military side. And I didn't know where I was going. And I ended up, I, I was uh, in the West Wing. Trump was not there that day. Uh, and I was just a few feet away from the Oval Office. And I was like, ah, should I tell people that I've been in Ukraine? Uh, I knew it was, uh, you know, everyone was scared. And uh, so about two hours later, I'm walking around with some friends who work there. And a woman who was one of the first employees of President Trump when he became president approached us and my friends introduced me. And she said, what's your story? And I said, well, I was just in Ukraine for two months. And she looked at me like 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 a like in a fairy tale, like a witch that was melting. And she starts screaming and swearing, get him out of here. Get this guy out of here. Who is he? Uh, simply, Jonathan, because I've been in Ukraine and I knew many people who worked in the White House. That's not I had <laughs> I had information. I mean, I I knew the reality here, you know, and 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 this is how silly and this was scary to me. And by the way, so they told me to leave and. Uh, my friends are backing up away from me. We're on the was it the North Lawn of the White House. My friends are backing up away from me. And I say to one of them, what should I do? He's like, you, you better get out of here. And my phone was still in, in the West Wing. You had to leave it there because they had some prop security problems. And uh, it was chaos. And, uh, and he, he's like, go get your phone quickly, but don't run. And then as he says that, I look and I'm aware of all the snipers on the rooftop. If you run, you could be shot. And uh, so I go to get my phone and, you know, as hilarious as this is, it was deeply upsetting because and like and now we see the consequences of silly, ridiculous leaders, uh, people in, in positions of power who are cowards, uh, who live in this like sort of silly Washington land where they're a one war. You know, the fact that I had been in Ukraine could scare them. Uh, no wonder they couldn't seriously address and fix things. So I think. But when I speak with Americans, you know, and, and sort of the, you know, who like Trump, you know, I say, look, Trump and Zelensky, maybe they were poised to work together. Someone did not want that to happen. That's A. But B, Trump caved in such a way that everyone that works for him was so petrified uh, of, of me simply because I had been in Ukraine. And, and this is very concerning about our leadership uh, in Washington. And this this atmosphere of paranoia, uh, the implication of sort of violence and, uh, uh, as I say, people people finding each other allergic through almost sort of, um, dare I say, you know, not real things, but almost superstition, uh, as it were. This is an ideal environment for Russian compromise. This is an ideal environment for active measures. And then parachuted into this, we have Christopher Steele's dossier. And I think David Satter had an interesting take on this. He says that there's almost nobody around now who is trained in the art of recognizing Russian tradecraft, um, you know, intelligence grade sort of materials. Um, he said as soon as he saw that, well, you know, whatever your opinion of Christopher Steele and whether he's naive or whatever, but David Satter said he thought this was a classic piece of tradecraft not designed necessarily for one side to win over the other, but designed to weaponize the entire media. And if you look at it from that point of view, they're not trying to convince you of something. They're trying to take your entire system down. They're trying to create this sort of paranoid, tribal, atavistic, completely divided society, and thereby weakening your enemy. That is seen as a win for them. If that is a true uh, scenario of what happened, then it was an extraordinary victory on the part of Russia, wasn't it? Absolutely. And I think, I mean, if we look at, you know, Russia through that, you know, throughout the entire uh, Trump presidency made themselves into the big bad wolf. And and everyone, you know, before that, you know, people sort of, you know, Putin was sort of a, you know, I don't know, George W. Bush is like, I looked into Putin's eyes and he was, you know, a very special soul. 
there's some video of Hollywood celebrities singing uh, Blueberry Hill with Putin. Uh, I mean, it's sort of he was just kind of this sort of clownish guy. But it was it was that it was it was just the very idea that he that Russia could have somehow intervened in the election. Uh, I think that's really I mean, I don't think I, there's scant evidence as to what they actually did. I mean, some Facebook posts, people that were going to vote for Trump were going to vote for Trump or, or Biden, no matter what, um, or Hillary, no matter what. But uh, uh, what they did and, and this is their this is where they're very they're, they're sneaky and they're well practiced at it uh, through the Soviet times. They convinced uh, everyone to be scared of them, that they were forced to be reckoned with, that they could do these things. Yeah. Uh, and I think, uh, and, and they, they, as I saw in that very personal story in the White House, they put, they curtailed any you know, the Trump presidency, um, and and so they have this, this extraordinary power messing with, with with our minds and with propaganda. And this is what they tried to do uh, with Ukraine since the very beginning. And and you know, and I, I, I mean, it's if you think about those first, uh, and I remember them sort of with this. I, I look back in that time with this deep heaviness. Those first days and weeks of the full scale invasion. I mean, I was in Lviv. You know, and I, you, we, everyone there, including me, we were resigned to the fact that Russians would be knocking at the door, that there'd be tanks coming down the street and just said, OK, we're going to choose to face it. But uh, the world, the Western leader, the Western capitals were pretty quiet those first days and weeks. I think many were hoping this problem would just go away. Ukraine would fall. Uh, but it was because regular people uh, saw images uh, on, on social media, on Telegram of what was happening? Like what happened? By the way, what Hamas did to Israel, which is, you know, heinous doesn't describe it, but absolutely awful, hideous, and heinous on October seventh. October seventh was the same that Russia was doing for an extended period of time, especially during those first few intense weeks and months of the full-scale invasion. And people saw that, and it was regular people saying, "This is unacceptable." And our politicians, who really, you know, I mean, many we don't have too many Winston Churchills these days, if any besides maybe President Zelensky, our politicians, they had to react to the people saying, this is not acceptable. And that's when the politicians began to respond. And as we've seen, still that response is tepid and slow. Um, but so the best way that the Russian propaganda lost in those early months, uh, because the people saw the carnage and the heinous things Russia was doing, and they didn't factor that in. But now we see, once again, I mean, it's like, we have to put ourselves in this experiment of had Hamas not invaded Israel, what would the headlines be saying? If everything else was the same, what would the headlines be saying about Ukraine right now? Oh, Russia bombed an art museum in Odessa? What did you, oh, and Ukraine is hitting, uh, you know, the Black Sea fleet is on the run. It's scattered and shattered in pieces throughout, you know, throughout the, the Black Sea. And the Russians had to leave Sevastopol in many ways. Uh, these would be these extraordinary headlines right now. And, and, and this is, the Russians are extremely adept at, at playing this. Uh, they look at our American sort of chaotic discourse and they know how to put some wrenches in the system. Um, and, and, and so we, we, we uh, you know, they, 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 they know how they know that we don't just trust each, that we don't trust each other. And so they can tell a Republican, I mean, these extraordinary things like they, they this idea that in Ukraine uh, religion is, is oppressed, uh, you know, and, and because finally after a year and a half, uh, at the behest of the people, Zelensky's government finally started to take action against the Russian Orthodox priest. Uh, the people were sick of it. They started to storm the churches in Lviv. Uh, by the way, the Russian church, I mean, no one goes to those churches. These are outposts, really, uh, of, of the Russian intelligence services. And, and so everyone hears that part of the story. But what you don't see, and, 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 and Russians, uh, Russians know that the foreign press, uh, when they come to Ukraine, you know, they can talk about Russian atrocities. But, you know, they're not going to talk about the church and the culture because it's not part of the elite life of a normal journalist at a pub in London. I mean, with all respect, but it's just not like but Ukraine is this incredibly, especially in the West, where the Soviets could not destroy their traditions. It's an incredibly traditional society. The churches in Lviv are packed, uh, not just on Sundays, but on random days when they have holidays. And uh, this is a vibrant nation. Uh, Jewish culture here, uh, you know, I mean, it, it, it was decimated in so many ways. Uh, during the Holocaust, when the Nazis invaded, uh, but but it, it is extremely strong, especially you go to places like Odessa and Dnipro. Uh, I, I've, I'm friends with the chief rabbi of Ukraine, and there's Jewish culture strong. I have many friends who are Crimean Tartar Muslims. Uh, they're they're fighting for their culture, and so the the traditions here 
thrive. And, and there's only this one little tiny piece. It's this Moscow created church that no one goes to anyway. Uh, and that somehow uh, the Russians uh, through propaganda organs have been able to convince a lot of Americans that there's no religion here when it's quite the opposite. It's an extraordinary perversion of the narrative. We'll come to that in a minute as well, because that that is a, a disquieting aspect of how some journalism falls for that. But let's unite the first two themes before moving on to the next one. One of those is um, freedom, what it actually means. The other one is the weaponization of our political system. And it seems to me that it could well be our concept of our measure of freedom that is actually opening us up to Russian propaganda in a way that the Ukrainians are not. Um, we place a lot of um, the onus on individual freedoms, uh, on a maximist version of those, which often don't come with responsibilities. Um, we don't look at social organization or cohesion. We don't look at the productive power of a country to create art, culture, technology, et cetera. But also we don't measure trust as a component of freedom, the ability to collaborate. It seems to me that where Ukrainians are winning is they're not looking at these labels of left and right. They're not looking at sort of their individual rights and how they may or might not be defended. They're looking at uh, whether our country is, is growing culturally and materially. Is it innovating? Is it moving things forward? Uh, rather than harking back to a nostalgic backwards looking, it seems to me that these are all far more healthy indicators of of, of freedom or indexes of freedom. Um, and it makes you less open to weaponized propaganda by Russia. I know it's a bit of a rant there, but I wonder what you think. Well, I mean, I, I, that topic resonates very much. Uh, when I was here in the pandemic, I met a professor uh, from Georgetown University, Jose Casanova. He's a theologian and, and political philosopher. And he said the Ukraine that he has seen since the revolution of dignity in 2014 is like what Alexis de Tocqueville described in his Democracy of America. Minus a big thing. No slaves here because Ukrainians were, Ukrainians were the slaves. Uh, but what Tocqueville saw in America uh, in, in the early 1800s was a society where we could have freedom because we could cooperate with each other and live with each other. And as I've been you know, reflecting on the idea of freedom very deeply uh, as someone who studied that and then, you know, someone who always has believed in that, uh, the idea of freedom and what is it, you know, when I was back in Texas living in Austin, people, we love to say freedom, you know, in the George W. Bush way, but what do we mean? What does that word mean? And I think I understand uh, two things here. One, uh, why, why so many, why America was created in many ways. People wanted to get away from exactly this, from the type of wars that we're having right now. They wanted to get away from it. And that makes sense. And that's why we had Manifest Destiny. It came at the expense of the American Indians. A lot of caveats and problems there. But that's deeply why uh, we, we, we went to America and, and our ancestors and, and built America to get away from these wars. That's one side. But the, there's an obverse to that. And going away, we cut ourselves off from our roots. Uh, and in and, and, and many ways, I mean, so the slaves that came to America, their roots are cut off in sort of an unrecoverable way. You know, you, like I, I, I was able to study and find out my family came from Ireland. I went and found my ancient, you know, distant cousins in Ireland. I had that possibility. I did that because I felt rootless in America. And, and I think that uh, rootlessness uh, is the source of a lot of our disillusionment. It's the source of our you know, and, and then things we can add to it, like the domination of the automobile. We all live sort of separately from each other. Uh, but at a, it's a fundamental rootlessness. And I realized that uh, I always had a sense of that. But I realized it here in Ukraine uh, when uh, it was right before the full scale invasion. So uh, Ukrainian uh, Greek Catholics in the West were celebrating Christmas in January. And Christmas, uh, several days of celebration, I was in uh, villages outside of Lviv. And every three minutes, there's a song. Everyone takes a shot and you have you, you sing a song and then a few minutes of conversation and then you go back to this ritual. And then I compare it to holidays, Thanksgiving or Christmas in America, where it's full of political arguments and it gets often violent. And, you know, we, we have so we, we know that a holiday is a nice thing, but we have no rubrics like look at a Shabbat dinner. We have we don't have anything like that uh, at a large scale. We've lost all that. And and then because of that, we I realize the holidays here in Ukraine because they, people still keep them up, especially in the West, 
where the Soviets couldn't destroy it, it, it gives people a mechanism for communicating, a mechanism for building society. And we've totally lost that in America. And, and so the America's, yeah, okay, we don't have war, we don't have nations invading us uh, you know, with tanks and, uh, and missiles, but our cities are violent. We have violence within. There's not violence within Ukrainian society. Um, I mean, Jonathan, Kharkiv, uh, 30 miles from Russia. Uh, now the well, it's dark now. The um, you know, when I was here last winter, there was no street lights whatsoever. I would walk down these streets, listening to music. The only threat is if a missile is going to come down. Uh, but I, the streets are safe. There's such a sense of cohesion and trust, um, especially now in the wartime. But even before, there's no petty crime. There's oligarchical theft and and corruption, uh, but. There's no petty crime. And I would never walk down a dark street in probably any American city. And so we avoided wars, but we we, we missed. Um, and this is where we needed some kind of soul examination in America, uh, as, as Dostoevsky was trying to do with Russia in, in the 1860s and 70s, you know, when he wrote Demons and other books. We need that in America. Uh, and I think, you know, every American I know who comes to Ukraine to help, you know, they're, I mean, it's scary here. Like there's this... Uh, Great place, the Frontline Kitchen uh, in Lviv. And people from all over the world come there, uh, retirees from Germany or New Hampshire, and they chop vegetables and make food for the soldiers. And one uh, day, we, uh, Russians had, uh, uh, one uh, like four o'clock in the morning, Russians sent three of uh, those Iranian suicide drones to Lviv. And it was, for many of these volunteers, it was the first time they heard the sounds of war. And I went to the kitchen the next day. I wanted to see how they were doing. And they were still there. They were smiling and listening to like Creedence Clearwater music and chopping vegetables. And uh, they're like, yeah, that was scary. But here we have purpose. And um, especially, you know, so whether it's Europe or, or U.S., so many people who come here, as scary as it is because of the threat from the Russians in the sky, uh, they find purpose on the ground here. Like you don't see right now in so much of the West. And I was only over for for, for six days uh, in in August, and you kindly uh, joined joined our event in in Lviv. But I wanted to come over and see whether all these things I'd heard were real. And I think it's very important to get that first hand experience because that also gives you a certain immunity to the propaganda. I think it's where people hear things at second or third removed that they start to build up these sort of alternative realities that then are very difficult to to um, to penetrate but you've painted a picture here which which again i you know i validate that i saw that on the ground of an incredibly resilient society that's in transition it's a transitional democracy but with extraordinary learnings and capability that is what we're defending not ukraine as it exists now we're defending the future of ukraine and its potential and i think you know freedom is all about the potential and the, you know the potential to create opportunities for people but the supply of weapons, as, as vast as it is from, from the US and other countries, has been delivered on an incremental basis. Do you feel that it is not aligned with a strategy that is firmly focused on victory? We're still supplying them to survive, to perhaps even, if you want to be super cynical, bleed Russia out, but not to win a decisive victory. Yeah, I would agree with that. And well, first, Jonathan, I would say Ukraine is not a transitional democracy. Ukraine post Maidan is a democracy, period. Uh, but it, it, but actually, more than that, uh, Aristotle uh, said there was a bad and good form of every type of government. So aristocracy is, uh, or sorry, monarchy is the rule of one. The bad version is tyranny. Uh, and then, uh, 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 what do you call it? Aristocracy is the rule of a few, the best. The bad version is olig oligarchy. And democracy is the rule of the many, the mob, it's bad. And he had this mysterious thing that he called democracy, uh, the rule of the honorable. And I, I studied under these great political theorists, and I would ask them, what, what does that mean? What, where are the examples? And no one could give me an answer. They said, maybe it, it means something like military virtue, like Sparta. And I was, when, it hit me when I was on a train from somewhere traveling, a wartime train in Ukraine. And as I went to get coffee in the cafe car, I see so many people I know, soldiers and civilians working for victory, everyone moving around the country. I said, I think this is the democracy. It's a good version of democracy where there's a rule of the honorable, um, especially now. And and so I would say U Ukraine is is a, is a great example, in, in, as we would say in the modern vernacular, of democracy. Um, and I think 
partly, this is why, you know, when we listen to the Western leaders, um, for the most part, uh, except for the, from the Baltics uh, and Eastern Europe, it's very, you very rarely hear anyone talk about the Maidan revolution, uh, especially, you know, Macron's not going to talk about that when he's got people protesting in France. You know, it's, uh, I, I think the Maidan revolution is a threat to, and this is what I want Americans who are, you know, talk about freedom, but don't believe in Ukraine to realize the Maidan revolution is a threat to elites. It's, it's a threat. I mean, Ukraine was a place where uh, not only Russians, but Americans would plunder. Remember Paul Manafort, Trump's uh, first campaign manager, uh, was in, is now in jail. He was here to plunder. Uh, so on left and right, we had plundering here. Um, and, and the Maidan said no more. The people were taking the country back. Uh, and really, uh, so I think that we, we, we need to notice there's a reluctance of Western leaders to talk talk about Ukraine's vibrant democracy. They love to lecture Ukraine. Like Janet Yellen was here recently saying Ukraine is so corrupt and all that. Like I, I was a journalist in New York State uh, upstate New York, covering local politics. I worked in News Corp. I've seen there's plenty of of endemic corruption, uh, some of it legal and much of it illegal uh, in our own country. Here, people have agency and ability to shed the light on the corruption, even in a time of martial law. Uh, the journalist of Ukrinska Pravda helped you know bring down the defense minister. So we need to look at that at a different angle. And I think this is maybe part of the reluctance even of Western leaders uh, to totally embrace uh, Ukraine. And Russia knows this, and Russia is able to spin this idea of this corrupt uh, cesspool. But because uh, we have indeed seen this slow trickle uh, of weapons, and in a way, like I hate it every time the White House says we're giving billions of dollars to Ukraine. I, I mean, you would think that they're smart enough to know this. That is only fodder for the you know sort of Republican opponents of Ukraine to say, oh, it's too much, and it's not actually billions. You know, it's a valuation of old weapons. Uh, you know, it's money that we spent a long time ago. And also, it's a good investment for America. Like, all right, so Ukraine got about 20 HIMARS uh, starting in, in 2022, which made a huge difference. I mean, thank God for that. And a great Ukrainians are grateful. Uh, Bakhmut was about to fall in uh, June 2022. HIMARS show up and Bakhmut doesn't fall for eight months. Uh, and it made a huge difference. Well, Poland is now buying much smaller than Ukraine, not at war, is buying 486 HIMARS. A $10 billion deal. It's the best free sample you could ever have. And so America is not losing in any way with this. And if you look at uh, September 21st, uh, a couple months ago, President Zelensky was in Washington and, and, and asking for help and support and weapons and making the case. Uh, he didn't get the same sort of welcome he had uh, a year before. And on September 21st, Thursday, uh, the White House and Jake Sullivan and others, uh, National Security Advisors said, uh, you know, we support support Ukraine, uh, but we're not going to give attackums. We're not going to give long-range weapons. 21st. 22nd of September, Friday. Ukraine uses the amazing storm shadows from uh, uh, His Majesty's United Kingdom, thanks to you uh, and your <laughs> your countrymen, and uh, uses storm shadow missiles with that precision attack on the Black Sea Fleet Naval Headquarters and the fleet itself. And no one really has paid attention to this. It was a few hours later Zelensky had just left Washington, and a few hours later, the White House says, all right, <laughs> we'll send you a few attackums. You've shown us, I think they were saying, you've shown us that you can use this well. And then within days of the attackums arriving, October 17th, Ukraine hits two Russian um, uh, air bases in, in occupied Ukrainian territory, places they could not have hit previously. Uh, and as General Hodges said uh, on your show a few days ago, uh, you know, uh, Ukrainians, uh, Ukrainians are showing when they have these weapons, Holding Crimea is not tenable uh, for the Russians. Uh, and so we see this works. And so right now in this time of, I mean, this is, Ukraine is winning right now because where are the weekly Russian infrastructure attacks? There, there have been no major attacks on Kyiv. Um, you know, basically Russia is only engaging right now in terroristic attacks. Uh, they hit a funeral party outside of Kharkiv October 5th. Uh, they hit the Odessa uh, uh, Museum. Right now would be the time if people really believed in victory uh, to to get Ukraine as many attackums as you can to get more storm shadows here, uh, the French scalps, and and Ukraine could really put the hurt on Russia. And this is the question. And there's a few like the opposition to Ukraine in in Washington mainly comes from Republicans, uh, and most Democrats support Ukraine. But the, here's the question that's not asked: Do they support actual victory? 
or do they believe Russia can be defeated? Or do they agree with what Henry Kissinger said in the Spectator magazine, December 2022, uh, that Russia is needed in the global equilibrium? And I think we see a lot of, we don't see courage, like Churchillian courage, Zelensky courage, Ukraine, U Ukrainsky courage. We don't, we don't see that in our leaders in Washington. Uh, there's a few Republicans that are, are saying this, like Michael McFaul, the chairman of the House Foreign Relations Committee from Texas. He's been sort of a voice in the wilderness on this. But in, in America, I mean, the, 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 the truth of this is getting obscured. Biden is not, his administration. He's given very forceful speeches, like he, when he came to Kiev, a very forceful speech. But they are not giving Ukraine the weapons needed at the pace needed to make victory possible. And while I say Ukraine is winning now because Russia is crippled in many ways militarily. This is, I mean, especially with the rockets and missiles. Like, I think last winter, 80 to 100 missiles every single week from Russia on Ukraine. And Ukrainian infrastructure, hugely decimated. I mean, often there was no power, no water. Uh, uh, no, no uh, They got the phone service working pretty much, but it was a very difficult winter. You know, if the Russians did that again, Ukrainians are ready now. You know, as I, I traveled the country the past few weeks, I was in Ishmael uh, on the Danube River uh, where they're, they're sneaking out uh, grain uh, and they, you know, to avoid the Black Sea. Um, Odessa, Kharkiv, Lviv, everywhere. Generators are standing at the ready. People have their stockpile. Everyone has their uh, power banks uh, ready. Uh, people are ready. And if Russia does that again, fine. Waste 80 to 100 missiles a week. Ukrainians will survive it. And maybe Russians are starting to realize that. Uh, and so this is a moment when if, if the West could really see this, uh, they would say, let's let's we can end this quickly. Uh, but instead, we wait and we give Russia time to restock. We get time for the world to get bored. And meanwhile, uh, I mean, the mobilization continues. I mean, I have, you know, many friends who, who uh, I think have been called up to fight. Uh, and, and so that's Russia's goal is to make every to, to wait and let Ukraine bleed out. And this is the last question, which really sort of caps that out. I mean, one, of course, is the failure of imagination. If you ask any Ukrainian, and I've spoken to, like you have, many, many dozens, if not hundreds now, so every good. single one of them will tell you that they have no fear of the collapse of the Russian Empire. In fact, that this is a moment that must come faster, not only to liberate Ukraine, but to give the Russians a chance to develop some kind of process that will eventually lead to a democratic um and wealthier future for them. But it seems to me that politicians in the West and indeed the media who tend to fall into fairly lazy narratives because it's what they think their listeners want to hear because it's the same that they stories they've traditionally told, that they cannot imagine a world without that entity. They cannot imagine a world where a superpower, an empire ceases to exist. And yet historically this has happened many, many times over. Um, are we also at the risk of, you know, the more the casualties rise, the higher the cost? We're starting to see Ukraine not as human beings, but as statistics. Um, and that also, you know, repels people because you have to imagine the terrible consequences of imagining this better future. But you also have to imagine the price that's required. And that puts responsibility on you, the listener, as well. And I think people are withdrawing from the prospect of the hard work that this agency implies yeah well, jonathan that's well said because agency and freedom requires you know work i mean and that's you know you you see people in russia uh and even you know i hear stories of you know like people had you know soviet-minded grandparents here in kharkiv uh before the full-scale invasion were like oh it was so much easier back then in the soviet times uh, you know, you just everything's there for you. I mean, not a lot. You're not happy, but it's OK. And, uh, you know, the wildness of freedom. Uh, yeah, you have to work. And uh, and uh, and and if you're not used to it, it can seem like a burden. But when you know it, it's something you never want to give up. And the Ukrainians have there's a word svoboda, which is the basic word for freedom. But then they have the word volia, which is embedded in the, the trident, uh, the letters. Uh, and it means the will to freedom. Uh, and this is something they've had deeply embedded in their culture. Uh, uh, and it's probably embedded in human nature in a deep way. And this is where, uh, you know, we have, like, can, I mean, I, I have friends working on the project of the breakup of the Russian Federation. And there are people within Russia who want to be free. 
Uh, but it, it and, and this I think should be a warning to us in America. Uh, like, I mean, you get to the point where you forget what it is. You know, we 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 lose our humanity. And when I look at our rhetoric and the way we argue, I mean, one thing that always concerned me, one reason why I got out of Fox News, I thought, what, where does this go? Like, are we just going to keep arguing and arguing the left and the right, uh, you know, what, for another 100 years until we just collapse, until we're all dead, until the country's dead? What is the aim? Why is every day of our lives couched in such anger? And, you know, here we are in the war and there's anger against the orcs, as the Ukrainians call the Russians, but there's joy here there's people singing and dancing and laughing and joking um, even at the front lines. I mean, especially there, there there's joy uh, and Ukrainians know how to live. Uh, part of that is the culture where you have these rituals that connect you and uh, you know, sort of give you reasons to be with each other. Um, but I think, you know, Russians uh, and we look at this with Hamas as well, like the societies that don't know how to live, you become monsters, you become, you, you lose your humanity and, this is what we have to ask uh, in in America. Uh, it's a it's it's a it's a it's a difficult and heavy thing, but I think you know we have to find ways. When I was in America before 2019, I know I had many friends that were talking about this. Like they felt, how do we deal with this isolation in our country? And uh, uh, it's there was a book by Thomas Wolfe, uh, who was a contemporary of Hemingway and Fitzgerald, uh, and he wrote a book called "Look Homeward, Angel." I think that diagnoses very well. It was our version of demons, of Dostoevsky's demons. It diagnoses very well our isolation and the problem. But I think if, if we're going to make the best of this, not only can we help Ukraine win with our American technology and weapons, but you, Ukraine could show America how to live again. And this is there's such a wall and a barrier to telling these stories. But for example, you know, all the Americans who listen to Joe Rogan and, and podcast about you know, self-help and human excellence, uh, you know, they take ice baths every day, like come here to Ukraine or watch stories from Ukraine. You can listen to my show every day. I'll, I'll talk for 10 minutes a day, but you don't need an ice bath here. We have missile baths and you have uh, this extraordinary stories of human achievement and excellence. You know, in America, we love the superhero movies, the Marvel movies. We watch the stuff. We eat popcorn because I think our lives don't have that element. And so we, we, we seek it here. It's here every single day. And if we could open our hearts to that and get beyond the propaganda and stop, step back and say, wait, let's explore the truth for ourselves. Maybe we can begin to be re-inspired again as Americans, uh, as the Ukrainians were. And, and again, back that revolution of 2014, Ukrainian, I mean, I don't know a single Ukrainian who regrets it. Every Ukrainian knows that had they not participated in that revolution, there'd be no war today, but no one regrets it. Uh, absolutely. And I think Ukrainians are far more united in their purpose uh, than, unfortunately, we are in our support of, of that purpose. Joe, this has been a huge privilege to speak to you. Incredibly stimulating conversation. I'm definitely going to write out the transcript of this and, and reread several times because there are so many nuggets in there. I definitely hope to repeat this. And, of course, hope to see you relatively soon uh, in a couple of months' time in Lviv again. Jonathan, thank you very much from uh, Kharkiv, 30 miles from Russia uh, under air alarm, but so far calm during this conversation. And uh, thank you for the chance to, to, talk, about, uh, to talk about freedom at a deep level, to step back and look at why we're in this fight. Uh, uh, you can follow our, our project at ukrainianfreedomnews.com, uh, my daily stories. And we also work to raise money uh, to buy drones and trucks and all kinds of things uh, for our friends at the front line.